All right, folks, we are just about ready to get started here. Um, and I can tell last week was a whirlwind for you because there were a lot of good questions about the material and the homework and the quizzes. So um, there's there's clearly some stuff we can still add to that uh, the, either I didn't spend enough time on last week or didn't get a chance to cover some of the finer details. And we'll add to that today. And um, this week might be, <clears throat> is likely to also going to have a um, small lecture at the beginning of lab um, to make sure that all the details that we may not have gotten to in lecture that you need for the lab exercises, um, we'll have a chance to, to hear from those. So uh, I will try to be cognizant of your time and the fact that nobody wants to listen to me talk for three hours straight um although it's happened on occasion um and we will try and uh keep that our uh, my expectations realistic when it comes to to how much i can talk um so random questions first um they're not all of that random uh, a lot of them are actually are related to stuff we've talked about in this class um so I've mentioned quantum very briefly talked about what quantum is the and the idea that those electrons can only have certain energy levels um, and that that they literally can't exist in between those energy levels they have to jump they have to teleport essentially um, they have to cease existing at one energy level and start existing at another energy level when we when we move an electron around from one energy level to another <clears throat> and that's that's one of the biggest ideas of quantum mechanics um that along with the the idea that light is quantized meaning that light exists in discrete packages of energy as well um that we call photons um but and one of the other aspects to quantum that's sort of a, a result of how how things behave at really really small length scales um is is an idea that's brought up with the um in this thought experiment called schrodinger's cat uh and schrodinger's cat is this very carefully thought out and very well explained hypothetical situation that i'm going to to go very quickly um over that it's it's essentially the idea that if you have a an opaque box that you can't see or hear anything that's happening inside the box um, if you put if you put a cat in that box along with a um, a timer that after a random amount of time will release um, a poison gas and kill the cat. Um, but you don't know how long that timer is going to go. It's a totally random um, chance that that happens. Schroden the interpretation of the way the math works in quantum mechanics says that once you seal that box and you have no way of knowing whether or not the poison has been released or not, um, that the cat is simultaneously alive and dead. There's a probability that the cat's dead. There's a probability that the cat's alive. Um, and mathematically, when we look at things the size of an electron, we can't say that they exist in one state or the other until we measure the system. So Schrodinger's cat was basically saying, well, the cat is alive and dead at the same time until we open the box and look inside. And when we open the box and look inside, that all of a sudden, um, now we don't have equal probability of both of those possibilities, and it's only one of those possibilities now, and that's called collapsing the wave function. Um, and which leads to one of the more well uh one of the better quantum mechanics jokes out there is heisenberg and schrodinger driving in a car um, when they get pulled over by a police officer and the police officer walks up to heisenberg who's driving and says sir do you know how fast you were going and heisenberg says no but i know exactly where i am um and the police officer doesn't like that and he says well you were going 85 miles an hour and heisenberg says great now i'm lost um and at which point the police officer thinks this all seems very weird and asks him to step out of the car. And then he opens the trunk of the car, says, sir, did you know you have a dead cat in your trunk? He says, well, I do now, asshole. 
because until he opened the trunk and looked inside, it might have been alive still. But once you open, once you disturb the system by measuring it, you change the system itself. Um, the other aspect of Schrodinger's cat is that um, Schrodinger was trying to to make a point about how absurd that sy that system is, that hypothetical system, um, and basically to to make the point that you can't apply quantum mechanics rules to large objects, to macroscopic objects. It just it's it's kind of silly to even think about it because when you're dealing with things as large as an entire cat, quantum rules of quantum mechanics don't apply the same way, and you can't try to imply them the same way. Um, so Schrodinger was very cleverly explaining how superposition works of probabilities and also saying, don't try to do this with real objects, or at least larger objects. Um, anyway, moving on, what is it in the sun that causes sunburn? I got myself a little sunburn this over the weekend, digging post holes. Um, and so I thought this was relevant. Sunburn is caused by any time um, you put enough energy into your skin cells that you start to, to denature the DNA and the proteins in those skin cells. Um, and that can take a lot of different forms. Um, UV light has that potential, um, has enough energy in it that it can actually cause mutations in your DNA, which is what causes skin cancer. Um, but in a milder um, setting, you just wind up causing sunburn, where you essentially um, you you cause the outermost layer of your skin cells um, to their DNA to start to denature, and and then your body reacts by basically um, killing off those skin cells and replacing them with new skin, which is why you peel um, when you get a bad sunburn. Um, but it's also the same thing that happens when you get a chemical burn. Um, or a chemical peel, um, you're basically just denaturing things on the outside of your skin and replacing it with fresh skin cells. Um, and there was and re a regular burn as well, for that matter, when you touch something hot. Uh, it all works the same way. When you damage those cells enough, your body, rather than trying to save those cells, just gets rid of them so that you don't run the and you have a lower risk of getting cancer or having other harmful mutations happen. Um, we'll save some of these for later. Um, for instance, we'll talk about the history and how they knew atoms had charges, and we'll talk about radio uh, isotope dating um, on uh, Thursday or on Wednesday. Um, but I have a bunch of stuff pulled up for um, this last question on the periodic table. Um, would it make more sense to have the periodic table arranged in a 3D model instead of the 2D model we all know and love? Um, it turns out there's not just one way to arrange the periodic table. Um, the way that we're used to looking at it is conveys a lot of information about how orbitals work um, and about a lot of properties and periodic trends we've been seeing. But it turns out you can there's hundreds of different ways um, that you can um, arrange the elements on the periodic table. Um, so, for instance, if you kept it two-dimensional, but you switched out squares for hexagons, you could get a structure that looked like this, where you've got hydrogen here, and then helium, lithium, beryllium, and then you start going in this spiral shape, where each of the different colors is going to represent a different block of the periodic table or a different group of elements. Um, I don't find this as helpful for being able to describe things like orbitals, but there are this does exist out there. And there are a number of three-dimensional ones also, um, one of which is based on, is this the one I want? Um, here's another two-dimensional periodic table that is a little bit hard to see. I'll zoom in on it. It's called a left step periodic table where you step to the left every time you um, complete an orbital. And it has them arranged in S block, D block, D block, F block. And you start at the bottom, hydrogen, helium, and then lithium, beryllium, and then boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So you can see that this doesn't look at all like what we think of a periodic table looking like, um, but it still follows some sort of organization when it comes to um, 
atomic orbitals and certain properties. Um, this can then be reinterpreted a number of different ways. For instance, um, you can turn it into a cube where you stack these different layers on top of each other, um, where you would wind up with, in, again, if I zoom in on parts of this, you have hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, you've got an S block, and then you've got a P block that's, and then underneath the P block is a D block. Underneath that is the F block that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, so there are lots of different three-dimensional organizations that were, make sense that people played around with, with uh, arranging them in the shape of a screw as a, as a sort of conical shape, where you start in the middle and spiral your way out and down. Um, you can actually get one. You can tell by the printing. This is from the 70s, probably, um, or 83, close where you can cut this out and you can actually tape this together and you get a um, you get a pyramid shape where each side of the pyramid is a different type of orbital. You've got your S, your S block on one face of the pyramid, your P block on the next, then your D block, then your F block. Um, there's a color coded version of that, um, of that uh, tetrahedral shape. Again, physicists have played around modeling it in, um, in computer simulations that where you can stack things up, you would start at the top and work your way down to make this sort of pyramid shape. Um, so I just wanted to, and if when you take uh, Gen Chem, those of you who are taking Gen Chem next year, um, your first writing assignment in a chemistry class will be um, to actually take three of these, pick three of these and sort of go through and say, what do they do right? What do they do wrong? What do you like about them, et cetera? Because there are some really cool ones out there. Um, I just picked the ones that are most relevant to the 3D question, um, but there's also lots of good other versions um, in this database. Um, spiral and helical formulations, and you can see, I'm just pick one at random. You know, from the 1950s, you've got this spiral version where you start in the middle and work your way out and things like that. Um, so since we're talking about periodic trends and how we can use, especially looking at orbitals and energy levels as a way to predict certain properties, I thought that was a really relevant question. Things that are directly related to the class as opposed to just fun random stuff that's kind of related to the class. Um, a number of you asked about using the shorthand notation for these electron configurations. Um, and so the, and again, the shorthand configuration just refers to um, putting a, an element in brackets and that element, we want that element to be um, one of the noble gases generally. So if we're looking at, there it goes. This is the simplified one. Um, so basically, if, after you get past 18 electrons, that's the, the cutoff for this class. Um, I'm allowing you to use this shorthand notation where you say, okay, well, everything up to argon is the same as normal. And then you fill in what happens past that. Um, or you could say everything up to krypton is the same as normal and then fill in. So if we wanted to look at, for instance, iodine that was on the, the quiz, um, iodine, I said specifically write the complete configuration, which means I want you to write everything out, starting with one S and going the whole way down. However, if you wanted to write the shorthand form of iodine, then we would just start with the last full row of the periodic table, the last noble gas that we passed through, which in this case would be krypton. And then you build up after that. And so the way that would look like So we, and we would write that as, okay, for iodine in brackets, you would say, uh, and I just blanked on this, krypton was the last one we just passed. 
And then you'd go from there. Okay, so after Krypton, and you go back and you look at your periodic table, um, we're in the fifth row of the periodic table. So we would say 5S2. Then we have to go to the D blocks. We drop down a level. So it's 4F, or sorry, 4D10. Then 5P5. So that's how we use that shorthand to avoid having to write 1S2, 2S2, 2P2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D10, 4P6, and then all of this. Right. So for again, for this class, if I say complete, I want you to write it all out. Show me that you can do that, even if it is repetitive. Um, if I don't say complete electron configuration, if it's more than 18 electrons, in other words, if it's past argon on, on the periodic table, you can use this notation where you put one of the noble gases in brackets as a shorthand. Right. But that's our are cut off. You do see it used for smaller elements all the time. Um, but for this class, while we're getting used to writing these, I don't want you to do that yet. All right, so next up, how does F block work? The F block is this section down at the very bottom. Um, and it works a lot. It's very similar to the D block um, in that it, the first row where you see the F block show up is not representative of the right energy level. So the same way that before we started filling up our first D orbital, we actually filled up the next energy levels S orbital. So that's why we go 4s2 and then 3d10. The first f block or the first f orbital actually belongs in the fourth energy level, but it doesn't show up till the sixth row of the periodic table. So if I label the rows here. just for the sake of keeping this straight. This F block is really just is supposed to just get inserted in between the S block and the D block. And it really fits in this, this double thick line here is there to indicate that, that this is a sort of a gap where we're fitting this F block in. So even though the first F block shows up in the sixth row of the periodic table, it really belongs in the fourth energy level. But it's just so high in energy, we don't start filling up the 4F orbital until after we've already completed the fifth, the entire fifth row of the periodic table. Right. So it's the same logic of, of your, your D block is offset by one row. Your F block is actually offset by two rows from where it should be as far as, as energy levels go. Um, so if, let me see, get the other. Uh, orbitals, top, I want this one. So if you look at the different colors on this graph, and this is the same one that was on one of our slides from last week, or, um, you start at the bottom, you start the lowest energy orbitals and you start filling it up and the different energy levels, every time you go up one energy level, you add a new type of orbital. So when you go from en energy level one to energy level two, you add a P block, you add a P orbital. When you go from two to three, you add a D orbital. When you go from three to four, you add an F orbital. But the, as you keep going and adding energy, this F orbital is actually higher in energy than all, most of the five, the fifth energy level, for instance. So um, if we wanted to write an electron configuration for something like 
um, anything, anything from the sixth row or below. So say um, radon, we looked at radon. We could start with xenon. And again, I'll go back, I'm gonna go back to the whiteboard here. So let's say everything's the same up to xenon. Um, meaning it follows our re regular rules. And what did I say? We were looking at radon, which is our N. So everything to xenon is the same. And then you get, you're in the sixth energy level, adding electrons to an S orbital. And then we actually, we actually wedge that F block in there. So the next electrons, if you follow the order of the atomic numbers on the periodic table, it goes into an F orbital. The F orbital can hold 14 electrons. And the F block, that first F orbital belongs to the fourth energy level, even though it shows up in the sixth row of the periodic table. So it goes 6s2. 4F14, and then we still have the D block to get through. So then it go, and so the D block is only offset by one energy level. So it'd be 5D10. And then we're back to the sixth energy level, 6P6. All right, so the, the D block and the F block are weird. They still follow our rules. You just have to know that the energy level associated with them is offset from the rows of the periodic table. And that's because of the overall amount of energy that it takes to put into those, those orbitals. Those D and those F orbitals are higher in energy, which means you don't start filling them up until after you start filling up the sixth energy level. All right. So questions about the F block or the D block for that matter. D is where things keep start getting weird. The F block still works just like the D block. It's just offset by two instead of being offset by one. A lot of questions about atomic radius and ionic radius. Um, and so it's, I'm going to, to remind you that the two most important things when we're talking about radius is always how many energy levels have electrons in them. And then the second criteria is, and how many protons are in the nucleus. So more energy levels means things are bigger. More protons for the same amount of energy levels means things are smaller. Right? So that's how we explained um, atomic radius when we were talking about atoms, not in terms of, of ions. We said, OK, well, if we look at, say, aluminum versus chlorine, they're, they're, they have electrons in the same energy level. They're both in, have electrons in the third energy level. They both have electrons in the third energy level, but chlorine has more protons in the middle, which means those electrons are getting pulled in tighter. Right, so that's how we explain the atomic radii and ions follow the exact same rules. Ions are just modifying the, the systems that are already on there, right? So Magnesium with a plus two charge and fluorine with a negative one charge are both going to have 10 electrons. So in terms of the number of energy levels, they're both going to only have electrons in the second energy level now because magnesium had electrons in the third energy level, but it lost them. So if they both have 10 electrons, they both have the same number of energy levels filled then our second criteria is what takes over. And that is whatever has the most protons is gonna pull the electrons in tighter and be, therefore be smaller. 
So a magnesium ion and a fluorine ion, despite having the same number of electrons, the magnesium is going to be much smaller because it has three more protons than the, fluor than the fluorine ion does. Right? And that causes everything to be pulled in tighter. Right, so ionic radius is not really any different than atomic radius. You're just going to, especially when you think about it from the context of how many electrons, what is my valence level of electrons? If you can pay attention to that, then that's going to make it so that it really is the same type of question. You're looking at number of energy levels occupied, and then you're looking at how many protons there are. Any questions on ionic radius? It's one of those things where, and this happens all the time in chemistry, um, and I remember as a student feeling like this, um, in lectures, everything makes sense and um, seems really easy when I'm doing example problems. And then when you get a blank piece of paper in front of you, you totally forget everything. Um, so what, just remember with these periodic trends, the, the reason we did electron configuration first is because electron configuration is going to tell us about all of these other properties like the size. If we know what energy level we have electrons in, if we know um, how many protons we have. Vey, do you want to say hi? Hello. This is valence <laughs> after the after electrons. It's not actually even my idea. My wife was a science major too. We met in organic chemistry. Um, and she had the brilliant idea to use valence as a name as well. So she likes to jump in in these lectures um, when we're talking about valence electrons and uh, show off a little. Uh, yeah, let me keep talking though, okay? Yeah. All right, say bye to everybody. Bye bye. Um, all right, so again, everything is going to come back to those electron configurations, and the same is true with ionization energy, right? The ionization energy is how much, how hard is it to take an electron away? So high ionization energy means it's really, really hard, hard to take an electron away from something. Low ionization energy means it's easy to take an electron away. And the way we can judge that is, one, the further away an electron is from the nucleus, in other, other words, um, higher energy levels, means it's easier to take that electron away. So if we were comparing things like say calcium and strontium, same column on the periodic table, but calcium has its, its valence shell is n equals four, and strontium is fifth energy level. The fifth energy level just physically is further away from the nucleus, which means it's going to be easier to take that electron away because the nucleus can't pull it as tight because it's further away. So calcium would have the higher ionization energy out of those two. Um, within the same energy level, it all comes down to which orbitals have electrons in them. So if we're looking at magnesium versus aluminum, magnesium has a full, when it's neutral, magnesium has a full 3s orbital, right? Um, and aluminum has the full 3s orbital and also has an extra electron in 3p, right? So you've got 3s2, 3p1 for aluminum. What that means is that the aluminum is going to be easier to take that extra electron away because when you do, you're going to be left with only full orbitals. Full orbitals are more stable than partly filled orbitals. So if we're comparing magnesium to aluminum, aluminum, yeah, it has more protons in the nucleus, but it has its 
electron configuration tells us it's got a really easy electron it can give away. That 3p1 electron is really easy to get rid of for aluminum. Magnesium has a four, has four, or is 3s2. So you actually have to break up a full orbital in order to take an electron away. Right, so, and then within the same orbital, it kind of follows the same idea as, as atomic radius. The further to the right you get, the closer you get to having a full orbital, the harder it is to take an electron away. So if we were looking at aluminum versus chlorine, it's gonna be a lot harder to take an electron away from chlorine than from aluminum because chlorine is so close to having a full orbital. It only needs to gain one electron to have a full orbital. And it's got more protons in the middle holding those electrons on. So again, it comes back to the electron configuration and this core idea of full orbitals and empty orbitals are stable. Partly filled orbitals are not. Right? So the, if we're getting to a state where we only have full orbitals, that makes it more stable. All right. So if you want to know the absolute highest and lowest ionization energy, the general trend for this is further to the top right, it's harder to take an electron away because you're closer to the nucleus and you have full energy levels. Further to the bottom left is easier to take an electron away um, because you're, you have more energy levels. So you're further from the nucleus and your, or, your energy levels aren't as close to being filled up. All right, so francium in particular, is it's so easy to take an electron away from francium um, that you don't even have for, for almost everything else you still have to give energy to the system it's still hard to take an electron away um, you have to have a place for that electron to go that makes it more stable francium is so unstable has such a low ionization energy that it'll actually just spontaneously start spewing electrons into the surroundings um if it's if it uh, is in the right conditions, if it's the right temperature. Um, so it's exceptionally low ionization energy. And helium, on the other hand, it's almost impossible to take an electron away from helium. Right, so again, we see the same general ideas in ionization energy as atomic radius. We can draw arrows basically to show increasing ionization energy going to the top right. Um, somebody asked about writing electron configurations for ions. So I thought that was worth going over one more time. The rules for filling up the orbitals don't change if it's an ion, right? So the only thing that changes if it's an ion is the number of electrons you have to work with, but you're still going to fill those orbitals up in the same order. Just a matter of where you stop changes. If you have a negative charge, you have extra electrons. So you're gonna be adding a couple extra electrons into the system. Um, and again, there's a, a figure um, that showed up in one of our one of our slides a while ago that I'm just going to redraw here on the board. Here. If, you, if you think of a graph where you've got increasing energy going up to the top, so low energy is at the bottom, high energy at the top, you can represent the orbitals with these lines. Each line can hold two electrons, an up arrow and a down arrow. And that represents that spin, um, electronic spin. And so the first energy level would just be a 1s orbital. And then you have higher energy, a 2s orbital, and a 2p orbital. Then you've got a 3s orbital and 3p, and slightly higher in energy, 3d 
And then you've got 4s. So this would be 3p, 3d, 4s, and then 4p. And then there's the 4d and then the 4f, and it just continues on as we start adding, keep adding more, um, more orbitals. So 4, 4d would be so one, two, three, four, five. And then 4f would be even higher in energy off to the side. This chart, the reason I'm able to do it from memory is because it's the same no matter what element you're talking about. The order that we fill these orbitals up is the same no matter how many electrons we have. So if we have an ion versus a neutral atom, it doesn't really matter for the electron configuration. All that Matt, the only thing that it changes is how many electrons we have to work with. So for instance, if we said um, aluminum, let's look at aluminum when it's neutral. Aluminum is number 13, right? On the periodic table. So that means if it's neutral, we have 13 electrons to work with. So we just start at the bottom, start adding electrons in until we've used up a total of 13 electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. This is what's called the, the atomic orbital diagram for aluminum. The electron configuration is just the shorthand of writing this out. It would say it would be. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s. I didn't give myself enough room. We continue that out until we get 3s2, 3p1. If it's an ion that we're dealing with, say aluminum is most stable as an ion when it's got a plus three charge. Plus three charge means it's missing three electrons, right? So which three electrons are we gonna are we gonna remove? Well, if we remove the low energy electrons, everything else would just fall down and settle to the bottom still. So if we're gonna remove three electrons, we're just gonna be missing. Those are just not going to be there anymore if it's an ion. If we've taken away three electrons, we're going to take away the three highest energy electrons. So the electron configuration for aluminum ion would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, because we only have 10 electrons to work with. And everything that has 10 electrons is going to have the same electron configuration. Right? For a given number of electrons, it's always the same electron configuration. Right? So aluminum ion is the same electron configuration as neon, which is the same electron configuration as fluor fluorine with a negative one charge or oxygen with a negative two charge. They all have 10 electrons. So they're all going to have the same electron configuration. Right, so ions, you're just either adding extra electrons or taking electrons away. All right, <clears throat> and then before we do the go over the homework and the conversion to gigagrams, um, somebody else asked why we call lead lead two ion and not just lead ion. Um, and this goes along with the idea that once we get to the d orbital, things get complicated. We saw that with our electron configurations. It turns out that's the same for some other properties, including charge. <clears throat>
So in the D block, and actually even past the D block, if you're if you're dealing with any metals to the right of column two. So most of the metals to the left of that stair step line, but to the right of column two, most of these metals actually can have multiple different charges when they're stable. So for most, for the non-metals, we just looked at how many electrons they need to gain to have a full energy level. For some of the simpler metals, we just looked at how many electrons they needed to lose to get to having only full energy, full uh, orbitals. But when d orbitals get involved, there's some other things that can happen that can affect how stable the ions are. So for instance, iron actually has two different stable ions. You can have iron when it's net neutral as a metal um, with a charge of zero, but you can also have iron two and iron three. Iron two has a plus two charge, iron three has a plus three charge. Uh, and lead is the same way. There are two different stable lead ions as well. There's lead two and lead four. Um, and they do still kind of make sense in terms of our orbitals. Lead two is stable because if lead loses two electrons, that would put it with the same electron configuration as mercury, right? It would go from having 82 electrons to 80 electrons. And if it had 80 electrons, then all of its orbitals that it has are full. It could also lose a total of four electrons. It can lose, lead can lose its, uh, what, 6s, or 6p electrons and its 6s electrons and have only full energy levels below that as well. Um, so because of the way that the energy levels work, um, you can wind up with multiple possible charges on these metal ions. And we'll get practice with naming them later, but the, in general, the way to specify the charge on a metal ion is you literally just say the charge. Um, so you could have copper one or copper two. Copper one has a plus one charge. Copper two has a plus two charge. Iron two or iron three. Mercury two or mercury one. Um, and in those cases, we're not talking about the isotope number. We're talking about the charge on those ions. And I, that was not critical to being able to answer the question on the quiz or the homework, right? I just said, this is lead to, here's its electron configuration, or what is the electron configuration? Um, you didn't need to know that lead to, all right, I told you that lead to was a plus two charge, and that's why we don't just say lead ion. <clears throat> all right, and then somebody wanted to see the conversion to gigagrams and to go over the conversion to gigagrams from the homework. Uh, Melissa starts the F blocks that leave only nine left for the good question. So one, one more thing before we leave electron configurations and orbitals. Um, it gets a little bit confusing as to whether lutetium and laurentium, laurentium, excuse me, um, belong to the D block or the F block. Um, so it doesn't really, it's not all that clear. Generally, what you want to do is you want to fill, um, you want to follow the atomic numbers. And sometimes, actually, my favorite, um, the best way to write the periodic table is in the wide form where you actually have the F block as a separate area, because that makes it really clear. If you, if you have 71 electrons for lutetium, um, you would still need to, you would only need to gain an additional nine to get to mercury. Lutetium is the first element in the five or yeah, the five D section of the periodic table. So um, you would need to only gain nine electrons to get to mercury. Uh, it would still be a total of, of um, 
5D10 to fill that up. The reason that, that these two are colored yellow here and labeled as F group metals is sort of by convention. Um, it really, lutetium really does belong to the 5D. It does belong in the D block, but a lot of times there's, there's not a lot of consistency between different textbooks as to how to write the F block. Um, so in general, we're still just gonna follow our rules of counting and following along the atomic orbitals and atomic numbers. And every D orbital can hold a to up to 10 electrons total. Um, there's no D block or D orbital that can only hold nine electrons. It's just a, a function of how we have to draw things out that makes it look like that for this one. Does that make sense, Alyssa? Cool. Um, and really, the best way to do that is if, if you have the wide form of the periodic table, also called the extended form of the periodic table, um, it would look something like this, where you do see lutetium as be, belonging squarely in the D block on the right-hand side. The F block are these, and this has been extended to have a the hypothetical eighth row of the periodic table. Um, even though we've never synthesized any elements down on this row, but in theory, there's also a G orbital um, that we would that we might see once we got to that point. And that's what I was actually looking for was probably just. That one's the one I was actually well, actually looking for. All right, so this doesn't have the element names drawn on it. Um, but you can see that it does have that D block as being separate from the F block and has them labeled as well. This is a pretty useful figure for remembering how those numbers work too, right? <clears throat> All right, with that, Let's talk about the homework for a second. Um, while I'm getting this pulled up, um, somebody asked a question about um, how accurate is that calculation for the mass of the water in Lake Tahoe? Um, well, our sig figs actually answered that question, right? I, I started by finding a source that seemed reputable that said that the volume of Lake Tahoe was 36 cubic miles. We can assume that that is two sig figs, right? Because of the way it's written. Um, so if you wanna know how accurate our final answer is going to be, well, our final answer has two sig figs. It's plus or minus 10 to the, 10 to the 13 kilograms. It's plus or minus one in this five, in this um, tenths place here. It could be 1.4 times 10 to the 14 kilograms or 1.6 times 10 to the 14 kilograms. But the answer to how good this calculation is, is based on how good is the number we started with. All right, so in this case, um, if you start with 36 cubic miles, we're using all of these are exact conversions. So you can convert mile, cubic miles to cubic feet by using our miles to feet conversion three times. And then you can go from cubic feet to cubic inches by doing that three times like we've done before. You can go from cubic inches to cubic centimeters. And then you can use the density of water that was given to go cubic centimeters to cubic to our two grams. And once we're in grams, we can say, okay, 1,000 grams is a kilogram and get our number in kilograms. If we wanted to get our number in gigagrams, we would just be using a different conversion here. And the conversion we could be using would be, um, let's see, kilo, mega, giga. So 10 to the nine grams is one gigagram. So our conversion would look something like 0.9. 
10 to the 9 grams is 1 gigagram. Right, instead of this kilograms conversion. All right, so getting to gigagrams, you would just use a different prefix. I would not try to start from kilograms and go to gigagrams. I would just punch it into your calculator again and use this 10 to the 9 grams is one gigagram instead of 10 to the 3 um, grams is one kilogram. Uh, any any other questions on the homework? Anything in particular that didn't make sense from the key? I think I gave you guys a, a pretty good um, explanation of how to use these atomic masses and how to use moles um, as a as a conversion. Although it does still take practice, we'll keep working with that. It's one of those things that when I write it, it seems really obvious, and but coming up with it yourself might have been tricky. But now that you've seen the trick, it's like algebra, right? Once you've seen the trick, um, it's not that hard to be able to write conversions like one mole of water is two moles of hydrogen. And number three, we'll go over how to do that problem today. Um, and if you didn't watch the, if you weren't here for a lecture um, and didn't watch the recording, you may have tried, been very confused by that and tried to figure out what's going on. Maybe you did figure it out. So good for you. Otherwise, um, you, if you didn't finish number three, you won't be graded down since I told you to leave that one off for last week. All right, let's. Let's talk about that type of problem, those weighted mass problems or weighted averages um, real quick. And then we'll take a break and come back and practice one. Um, so the, the key to using the atomic masses on the periodic table, and I, I said this once and um, we didn't really go over any mathematical examples, is that they're, they're weighted averages of the way that different isotopes occur in nature on Earth. Different planet could have totally different atomic, not totally different, could have different atomic masses because um, our particular planet has a certain ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12, for example. Other planets might have a different ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 occurring naturally. So these are specific to our planet. Um, and they're actually even specific to our particular time on our planet, because there are certain elements that used to be present on our planet um, naturally that aren't anymore due to the age of our planet, how long it's been since our solar system formed. Um, so, for instance, um, technetium. Technetium is the first synthetic element on the periodic table. Um, meaning it doesn't occur in nature in our time era. But when the Earth was first formed, there was definitely some technetium here that then decayed through its nuclear processes and turned into other elements. And um, on the flip side, uranium is radioactive. It's got a long enough half-life. It lasts long enough naturally that we still have uranium present from the supernova that formed our, our solar system originally. but in another 4 billion years, the amount of uranium present on Earth would be next to nothing, potentially. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head. Um, but the, the natural atomic mass that we have on our planet is a result of where we are and when we are. Um, so all that to say that the atomic masses on the periodic table we're just basically going to average out all of the atoms in a sample and say, okay, well, if I have this many atoms that are this isotope and I have this many atoms that are another isotope, we're just going to find the average of all the atoms. Um, and so we do that by doing a weighted average where you take the, the ratio 
of a particular isotope and you multiply that that abundance which is called the abundance um which is this greek x letter it's a chi actually but it looks a lot like an x um sort of just like a curly x um and that's basically the the decimal equivalent of of the natural percentage of that particular isotope the percent by mole if you will um and so another way of thinking about it is it's this natural abundance is the probability of picking a certain isotope if i picked an atom at random from a sample what are the odds what's the probability that i get say carbon 12 as compared to carbon 13 or chlorine 35 as compared to to chlorine 37 right so you take the probability of getting a certain isotope times the mass of that isotope and then you just add up what's left so remember this greek letter sigma means sum means add everything up so you're just going to add up the percent the probability times the mass of each isotope and when you add all those together that gives you your overall weighted average so for instance chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes on Earth. You get chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. The natural abundances for the chlorine isotopes are 76% chlorine 35 and 24% chlorine 37. In other words, 76% of all of your chlorine atoms are going to be chlorine 35. 24% of those ions of those atoms are going to be chlorine 37. If we want to know the atomic mass of chlorine, we're just going to take the percent abundance of each of these times the corresponding mass. So you say 0.76, that's 76% as a decimal, 0.76 times the mass of 35, and 0.24 times the mass of, of chlorine 37 and just add the numbers up. <clears throat> All right, so mathematically, if you've ever seen a weighted average for like for a grade in a class that had categories, say for instance, um, you know, your final exam is worth 30% of your grade, your assignment is worth 40% of your grade, and your quizzes are worth 30% of your grade. That's another weighted average. You would just take those percentages times your score in each category and add them all up. Right? A weighted average just means we're not treating every number that we're averaging the same. We're weighting some of them higher by multiplying by these decimals. Right? So to uh, I'm just going to do this on PowerPoint instead of the board for now. So our atomic mass for fluorine is going to be 0 0.76 times 34.9689 AMU. Plus the other piece of this is um, the other percent, the other percent abundance, point zero point two four times thirty-six point nine six five nine. When we do that and add them up, we should get the number on the periodic table for the atomic mass of chlorine. Thirty-six point nine six five nine. 
and we get 35.45. And sig figs on this would be a little weird because technically we would only be allowed to keep, um, we would only be allowed to keep two sig figs on our answer because we had two sig figs on these percent abundances. So generally I will give you more sig figs on your percent abundances for these kind of problems in order to, so that we could actually get more sig figs on our answer. Um, because so 0.76 times, if we just look at the two numbers before we add them, we get 26.57 for the first number, but we have to round that to two sig figs. That would give us 27. And then 0.24 times, times the 36 number is gonna also give us a number with only two sig figs. So we're gonna end up with a number with only two sig figs, um, which is hard to compare to the periodic table, right? So I'll try to give, remember, make sure we give it enough sig figs for our percent abundances. Right, but the, the individual process is not that tricky, right? It's knowing what a percent abundance is. It's just that probability. And then I have to give you a lot of the pieces to this. There's only so many ways I can ask this question, right? I could ask you to solve for a percent abundance, or I could ask you to solve for the mass of a specific isotope, but I still have to give you the rest of the pieces of this equation, right? or let you look it up at least. So when we come back, we'll do another practice problem. So take a 10 minute break, and then I'm gonna give you five minutes to start working on this as well. So in 15 minutes at quarter till 2.45, um, I will start working through this and we'll get a number. I, and I guess I, I should specify so as to not confuse you. Um, let's only look at the naturally occurring part. So no, we're not doing the average atomic mass value for each of these sources. Let's just ignore the commercial source one. And just look at the natural sources of lithium. And then we'll talk about how you can, how you can um, change those percentages. And that's what they're talking about in the second example. <laughs> 
All right, folks. Let's start going through this. And as usual with word problems, one of the good places to start is to, is to pull out any numbers um, and write them as their variables. You can kind of start seeing how to arrange this. Um, so we have chi for lithium seven and chi for lithium six. Chi for lithium seven is gonna be 0 0.925. So again, we're taking that percentage and turning it back to a decimal, because um, just like a probability, if you say you've got a 25% chance of winning, the probability has to be between zero and one, right? Because percent means for every hundred. So 92.5% lithium seven means that the, the decimal version is point, 0 0.925. Oops. That's not what I meant to do. Um, the percent abundance of, of lithium six is therefore 0 0.075. And then we have the masses, the mass of lithium six and lithium seven. We're gonna put those in here too. Seven point zero one six zero zero. So lots, lots of sig figs on these. We're going to be limited by our percent abundance sig figs more than anything else. Just like on the last example, mass with six is six point zero one five one two amu. So if we want to know the atomic mass of lithium from this source, we just take the, the probability of lithium seven times the mass of lithium seven plus probability of lithium six times the math, mass of lithium six. So atomic mass equals 0 0.925 times seven point zero one six zero plus zero point zero seven two seven five yeah times six point zero one five one two which uh, if we're plugging that in and we want to make sure we're getting our sig figs right, make sure you do your multiplication before and rounding before you add them. So atomic mass is going to be equal to 0 0.925 times 716. We keep three sig figs, so 649 and again, where these the percentages don't have any units on them, but the masses do. So that's six point four nine AMU plus point zero seven five times six point oh one five one two. We're only going to keep two sig figs for this one because we only had two sig figs on our percent abundance. So zero point four five. So our final number for atomic mass for, for lithium be 6.94. And if that's from a natural source, that should match the atomic mass on the periodic table. So we can always double check that for to check our work. 6.94 does, in fact, match the atomic mass of lithium right here. <clears throat> Um, however, I made a big deal earlier about the fact that these masses are based on what's naturally present on Earth, right? Which means that there's other possibilities. If we get our samples from other sources, especially if one of our sources is um, uh, the way we get a lot of these different isotopes is from nuclear reactions, meaning reactions where you've got 
number of protons or neutrons changing in a specific nucleus. Um, and so a lot of nuclear reactions can wind up with different ratios um, of and different percent abundances. So if you if you recycle lithium from a commercial or from a military source that was using lithium, um, lithium specific isotopes get enriched it's also sometimes where you remove some of the um, lithium seven or and replace it with lithium six. So you would wind up with a higher percent abundance for lithium six than normal. Um, that gets used a lot in um, some nuclear reactors as a way to stabilize the reactor and keep things from becoming um, from from going out of control. Um, so any enriched sources are going to always have different ratios. So enriched uranium doesn't have the natural ratio of uranium 235 to 238. Um, you can we can do the same thing too with if we use um, a specific radioactive isotope of iodine um, and inject it into into your body. You can use it to trace um, thyroid function because iodine accumulates in your thyroid. And so if you use an, a radioactive isotope of iodine or a sample that's enriched, that's not the same ratio of radioactivity as normal, then you can see you know, where things are accumulating in the thyroid and diagnose certain processes. Um, so any sort of, they refer to that as nuclear imaging a lot, um, is going to have different percentages than the normal. So just a, a note about the rest of this. It doesn't really change the process. If you want to know the atomic mass of an enriched source, you're just going to have different, um, different percent abundances. But the process is the exact same. It's, it's always just a weighted average. The mass of each isotope times the probability of that isotope and add everything up. Which I believe also takes care of that that last problem on the, or problem number three that I told you guys to skip, it, it gave you everything except the mass. It gave you the atomic mass. It gave you the, all of the percent abundances and said, what's the atomic mass of silicon 29? Well, so mathematically it looks a little bit more complicated because we're dealing with three isotopes instead of two but the same process for all of them. And we know everything except for this number right here in the middle. That's all we're trying to solve for. That's the only thing we don't know out of this big, long math equation. All right, atomic mass is straight off the periodic table. Everything else is given except for this mass. So you just have to do the algebra to solve for it. And that's basically, the, those are the only two ways I can ask a, a question like this, really, right? If it's talking about percent abundances and isotopes, I'm either asking you to solve for one of the pieces on the left-hand side or for you to find the atomic mass, the overall atomic mass, the average. These can be a lot of work to actually punch it into the calculator, if you consider that a lot of work, but it's not that tricky once you get the hang of it. And weighted averages show up a lot um, in math and probability. All right, let's talk, oops, let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, charges. And we're gonna, basically, I'm gonna reframe this in terms of what's called the octet rule. I don't really like that name very much because I think it oversimplifies and I don't see the point in um, you know, condescending to you guys. You guys are smart enough to understand how electron configurations work. Um, therefore, you're smart enough to understand that it's not really the octet rule, it's the full energy level rule. It'd be a better name for it. Um, and it's just based around the idea that atoms are most stable with a full valence. So this is something we've actually been talking about for a while. We're just formalizing it so you're familiar with the term octet rule. Um, for most elements, that means that, especially for nonmetals, things are going to be the most stable when they have eight valence electrons. 
So for non-metals, we're generally looking to gain electrons until you get to the same um, electron configuration as a noble gas. So if you're in um, the, what is that, C17, 16, the 15th column, nitrogen, nitrogen is going to try and gain three electrons to have a total of eight valence electrons. So nitrogen is most stable with a charge of negative three. Oxygen is most stable with a charge of negative two. Um, the reason that this figure in particular stops after just a couple of elements and leaves off the D block is because the D block makes things complicated. And with non-metals, generally we're trying to give away electrons to become more stable, which means we're not trying to get to a full octet, we're trying to get rid of electrons so we don't have a partially filled orbital. Right, so again, a better name than the octet rule would be the full energy level rule or the full orbital rule or something like that. Um, but octet rolls off the tongue easier and it makes it easier. I'm, I'm gonna pick on biologists because um, I remember being taught the octet rule in the biology class and just being taught by my particular biology teacher that don't worry about why, just know that things want to have eight electrons in their outer shell, which bothered me and made me dislike my biology teacher because I don't want to ever tell you just don't worry about why. Um, sometimes I will say it's very complicated, so here's the easy rule, but you can always ask why. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that a lot of older periodic tables use this way of numbering the columns that uses Roman numerals mixed with letters. Um, so it's like 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, and then there's the D block has a bunch of like 1B, 2B, et cetera. Um, it's very inconsistent between textbooks as well. So the most consistent way of doing this that I found is just number the columns straight across, not worrying about 1A, 2A, 3A versus 1B, 2A, et cetera. Um, just number them 1 to 18 straight across. Ignore the, the F block because it doesn't usually wind up being useful unless you go into nuclear engineering. All right, so here's the crux of where we're going with all of this and why knowing the charge becomes important um, is because we don't usually just have ions floating around by themselves. Ions have a charge by definition, right? And we have a fixed number of electrons on our planet. So we can't just get rid of electrons and throw them off into space. Those electrons would have to still be there somewhere. So we, we tend to see systems where we wind up with positive ions, cations, that are matched up with negative ions, anions. And they're, all, they're generally going to match up in a way that makes their overall charge add up to zero. <clears throat> and that's what's called an ionic compound. An ionic compound just means you have, this, you have the same number of positive charges as negative charges. And they're going to tend to stick together because positives are attracted to negatives. <clears throat> so if we're trying to predict the formula of an ionic compound, we just we need to know what the charges are of the individual ions. And once we know that, we just pair up enough of those ions so that the total charge on the compound adds up to zero. So for instance, if we look at calcium on the periodic table and oxygen on the periodic table, calcium becomes most stable if it can give up two electrons and become calcium with a plus two charge. Right, it's got two electrons in its 4s orbital. If it gets rid of those, then it's just got the same number of electrons as argon, and you've got a stable electron configuration. Oxygen, on the other hand, wants to gain two electrons so that it has the same number of electrons as neon, 
So what this means as far as the ionic compound, we, when we want to figure out what the ionic compound is, we always start by writing down the charges of each of the individual pieces. So for instance, calcium, when it's stable, has a charge of two plus. It has to lose two electrons. And oxygen is going to have a charge of two minus. So if we want to know what the, the compound is, well, we just need the same number, the, the smallest whole number ratio that makes the charges add up to zero. So if we want the charges to add up to zero for every one calcium, we need one oxygen. So our formula for this compound would just be one calcium to one oxygen. We don't really usually write the subscript for um, if we just have a one there, but we can. So for every one calcium, you need one oxygen. All right, so just to reiterate things, the number written to the top right of an element is your charge. The number written to the top left of your element was your mass number. Number written to the bottom right is how many of that atom you have. So if we want to say we have one calcium for every one oxygen in this compound, we could write it like this. Or frequently, if it's if it's you don't have a number written, you just assume it's a one. So for instance, for water, we don't write H2O1 because we just assume that it's a one. <clears throat> All right, so our So that would be the formula for the ionic compound that we'd make with calcium and oxygen. We get there by finding the charge on each of the ions and then balancing the charges. In this case, just one to one makes the charges add up to zero. Um, let's skip sodium and chlorine for a second and let's look at potassium and sulfur. So potassium, when it's stable, is going to have a charge of plus one because it's in column one on the periodic table. It needs to give away a single electron to be stable. Sulfur needs to gain two electrons, just like oxygen. So we've got potassium with a plus one charge and sulfur with a two minus charge. And again, plus one and one plus mean the same thing. Doesn't matter if you switch the, the symbol, the plus and minus on that one. <clears throat> so what is the ratio we need to get to make the potassium ions and the sulfide ions add up to zero? Any thoughts? Anybody? Dana? Would it be two potassium and just two sulfur or no? Close, so two potassiums would yeah. give you a total of plus two, right? And you'll yeah. and you want a negative oh, two, so two potassium to exactly okay. So our formula for this compound would be K two S two potassiums for every one sulfur. Right, and it, so no matter what the charges are on these ionic compounds, we just need to. It's like finding your lowest common multiplier. Remember doing that in math in high school or middle school or whenever they teach that? 
whatever you need to do to make these numbers cancel out and add up to zero. So sodium and chlorine winds up being another pretty simple one if we look at the periodic table. Sodium is going to be a plus one charge because it has one electron to give up. Chlorine is going to be a negative one charge because it has it needs to gain a single electron. So our charges would wind up being Na1 plus and Cl1 minus or minus one. And again, in this case, now, if we want them to add up to zero, we just need one of each of them. So our formula would just be NaCl. And so that's the way we get the formula is always the same. You figure out the charge on each of the pieces and you make the charge add up to zero. If we want to name these, it actually is, is pretty straightforward to name ionic compounds because the charges are what dictate how many of each one you have. You don't need to say the charges generally. If we want to say the, um, the name of this compound, we just say the name of each ion. And so the name of the of a positive ion is just you say the na same name as the element. Name of a sodium ion is sodium ion, or just sodium. In the um, once we put all this together, the name of a negative ion, an anion, is you just drop the ending and you add ide. So instead of chlorine, if it's a negative charge, you say chloride. Instead of sulfur you say sulfide. Instead of oxygen, you say oxide. Phosphorus becomes phosphide. And then you just put those together. So then again, the name of the positive ion is just the name of the element, as long as it's, it's um, not a, in the D block. So the name for this first one would just be calcium. And then we drop the ending of oxygen turn into oxide, so calcium oxide. If I say calcium oxide, that really is the same as saying CaO, because the charges on calcium and the charge on oxide are always the same. Calcium as an ion is always plus two. Oxygen's always minus two. So if I say calcium oxide, that means the exact same thing as saying CaO. So sodium and chlorine would become sodium chloride. Potassium and sulfur would be what? Oops, did that again. Potassium sulfide. <clears throat> All right, because because potassium ion is always the same charge and sulfide is always the same charge, we don't need to say how many of each of them we have. It's not dipotassium sulfide. Don't want to use those prefixes like mono, di, tri. We're saving those for covalent compounds that we're going to talk about probably on um, Wednesday. If it's an ionic compound, all you do is say the name of each ion, not how many you have. <clears throat> so here's some more practice with these. If we wanted to, and some the charges have been written on these, but if you wanted to um, practice finding the formulas for some of these, if you want to practice finding the formula, say for magnesium chloride. Well, for every one magnesium, 
with a plus two charge, we need two chlorides. So the formula would be MgCl2. All right, so uh, here is, and then the one other thing to talk about that already showed up on your homework a little bit um, is this idea of molecular mass. So molecular mass is the same thing as atomic mass. It's how many grams per mole. The thing is, is if you have a compound that has more than one um, element, or more than one ion that you have to add up to get to that compound, the molecular mass is just going to be the sum of the atomic masses. So for instance, for, for sodium chloride, for every one mole of sodium chloride, we have one mole of sodium and one mole of chloride. So the overall atomic mass would wind up being the mass of sodium plus the mass of chlorine. So mass of sodium is 22.991 plus 35.5457. Point, five, so your overall a molecular mass is just the sum of the pieces, right? And so then, then what it's really saying is your, your new atomic mass is saying for every mole of this entire compound, it's X number of grams, right? It's just the sum of the pieces. So for potassium sulfide, where we have a more complicated formula, at least a little bit more complicated. If we have a mole of potassium sulfide, that's one mole of sulfur and two moles of potassium. So in our atomic mass, we would just factor that in. We'd say, okay, two times the mass of potassium plus one sulfur would give us our atomic mass. So numerically, that would give us um, two times, let's see, where did not my periodic table go? Two times potassium, which is 39.098, plus one times sulfur which is 32.066. So our overall atomic mass for the potassium sulfide would be all of that put together. So what, 112 or so? All right. Let me see what we had coming up next. Let's go. So here's a slide that, that um, lists out in more detail the nomenclature. Nomenclature is just a fancy word for how to name things. Um, the nomenclature for ionic compounds is you just say the name of each ion. So RBI, written this way, not runs batted in, rubidium iodide. RB is your cation, and iodine, which I drew all over, is your anion. So to name it, you just say rubidium iodide. B-A-S-E. This one becomes really important that we keep track of our capitalization too, right? A couple of you got a little sloppy with that on, 
on the quiz on um, a couple of things. Um, barium is capital B, lowercase a. Selen selenium is capital S, lowercase e. So the name for this, selenium, is going to be our negative charge. It's got a negative two charge. The barium has a positive two charge. And we know that just by looking at the periodic table. Selenium is right here. So it needs to gain two electrons. Barium is over here. It needs to lose two electrons. So the name of that compound then is barium selenide. Drop the end of selenium, put IDE. MgBr2 would just be magnesium bromide. <clears throat> All right, the last one, last wrinkle on this is the one that I hinted at, or not hinted at, that I explained briefly at the beginning when talking about lead ion versus lead two ion. Um, the elements, the metals that I've boxed in red are the only ones that have, the rest of them have predictable charges, but they have more than one possible stable charge. So if it's in column one or column two, we always know what the charge is going to be on those metals. And if it's one of these five metals that are boxed in red on the right-hand side, we always know what the charge is going to be. But for everything else, all of the other metals, all of the D block and these green ones to the bottom right, and actually the line between metals and non-metals goes, is that stair-step line, right? Everything to the left of that stair step line can have multiple possible charges, with the exception of the first two columns and these five. So if we have a metal ion as one of our pieces to an ionic compound, we just specify what the charge is on that metal ion. So instead of just saying lead, we say lead two or lead four. And that's indicating that that's lead with a plus two charge or lead with a plus four charge. Instead of saying just iron, so for instance, FeCl3, the charge on the iron has to be plus three because chlorine is negative one. So if chloride is negative one and there's one iron counteracts all three chlorides, the charge on the iron has to be plus three. So the name for that, we just call it iron three chloride. If we have Cu2O, Cu is copper. And it'd be a good idea to get the, all those names and uh, element symbols down. So um, this part comes a lot more easily. Um, Cu2O, well, oxide is always, when it's a charge, is always a negative one, or sorry, a negative two. So for copper to cancel out a negative two, and it takes two coppers, that means each copper has to be a plus one. So the name would be copper one oxide. I have a question. Yeah. So will we only know, um, like, for example, for iron to put three or two when it is in a formula? Basically, yeah. If I okay. just say the compound that forms between iron and oxygen, you don't know if it's iron two oxide or iron three oxide. Okay. So the whole idea with this naming is that the name can give you the formula and vice versa. The formula can give you the name. Right. And that's why we specify with these with these um, Roman numerals and by saying that letter oh. or sorry, saying that number. Got it. Right. And so the last point I'm going to make to stress this is if you're saying the name of the element, 
then the number is talking about the charge. So iron three chloride. So uh, if we had say Fe two O three, the name for that compound is going to be something oxide, right? Because we've got oxygen with the negative charge. So it's going to be oxide. In order to make these charges balance out, if the oxygen has a negative two charge and there's three of them, that adds up to a total of negative six, right? So two irons are counter counteracting all of that negative six. So the charge on each iron has to be plus three, right? So, and you can break it up and rewrite them with the charges so you can make it clear to yourself. There's, if you have two iron or Fe3 plus ions and three, oxides, that adds up to a total charge of zero, right? So the name for this compound then would be iron three. Oxide. Right? So if you're saying the names of the element, then the number is referring to the charge. If you're saying the abbreviations, then the number is referring to the subscript. So iron three oxide is the name. The formula is Fe2O3. So if I say Fe2, I'm talking about how many irons I have. If I say iron three, I'm talking about the charge, which gets confusing, but I'm gonna to continue to stress that and remind you guys of that. If you're saying the formula, then the number that you're saying out loud is the subscript is how many you have. If you're saying the name, then the number is referring to the charge. All right, and so we'll end there for today. And we'll practice with this. Um, if you have lab today, again, I went a couple minutes over and I wanna make sure you guys get a, a little bit of a break because I do have to start with a brief um, introduction lecture. So let's start at uh, 3.35. We'll start lab today. Um, and if you can't be there today, it will be recorded and posted later. Um, and for now, I'll go ahead and stop.